stored this sucker too, so I don't forget. And we'll go from there. So um, welcome. And uh, as I said, CBD Dog Health was kind enough to share this slide deck with me so I can get you a little bit more information about the science part of CBD and uh, marijuana and the endocannabinoid system. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of inf interesting stuff going on right now, especially since it, it seems like um, the federal government may go forward with legalizing marijuana, um, both recreationally and medically, so it becomes decriminalized. And that makes um, accessing things just a whole lot easier for, for people, I think. And, and also, it gets you some level of understanding about what... Um, what's good and what's not good. So let's see, we can play this. Yeah, and it should be full screen now, hopefully. Good. So the, you know, endocannabinoid system, if, if have either of you done much research on this, by the way? Um, you've done some, yeah. And, and I know there's a lot of folks that have been checking out uh, CBD Dog Health's broadcasts, and they have just a ton of information all the time. So that's really cool. But um, it's, it's really interesting because in the entire animal kingdom, all animals, uh, including invertebrates, um, invertebrates and in invertebrates, have an endocannabinoid system. Um, and the only animals that do not are the arthropods, so the insects, mollusks, and things of that nature. And there's sort of three parts to the endocannabinoid system. There's the endogenous ligands, which are the sort of the molecules that actually stimulate things, um, the membrane receptors, and then the deactivating enzymes. So, and that's sort of true for any, any type of neurotransmitter. There's, there's gotta be a receptor or any substance for that matter. There has to be a receptor for it. And then there also has to be a way to sort of turn it off so that the body doesn't get barraged with things. Um, the, you know, and it's just, the endocannabinoid system is, does a lot of different things, but its main job is to help maintain homeostasis. And it does that in harmony or in complement to the immune system and the neurologic system. And using those two symptoms, then it's able to exert effects throughout the body based on the direction of, um, of those two systems. But it, you know, it, the, some of the known effects are to help reduce pain or modulate the effect of pain, uh, reduce the seizure th threshold, improve appetite, digestion, all of those good things. But it, I mean, it's, its effects in the brain are just astonishing at times um, as far as how it affects and where it affects. And, and it, it just is, a, you know, we've got these receptors all the way through the body. Uh, and there are two main type of receptors, CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors. Some organs are pure CB1 receptor laden and some are purely CB2. And then some of them are mixed. Obviously the brain, um, any of the endocrine system and then the spinal cord is more of a mix of one and two receptors. And then the skin interestingly is, uh, has a mix of one and two receptors. The, the thing that's really cool is that the effect of homeostasis um, is carried out by, again, by sort of getting the brain to talk to the rest of the body and the immune system to talk to the rest of the body. So the other thing that's interesting too is that the CB1 receptors seem to have more to do with circadian ry ry rhythm. So, you know, knowing when to kind of crank up digestion, when to crank up the muscles for activity based on daylight, things of that nature. And then the CB2 receptors have a lot more to do with the immune cells. And in fact, they are the CB2 receptors on, on T cells are when they are stimulated, that's what tells them to become natural killer cells so that they can go about the body and not knock out any type of infection that may be present or attack a virus or 
um, you know, any swift cleanup that needs to be done. So it's just kind of astonishing out there. Um, and in this, how this sort of came to be, dogs are often the study model for everybody else. And in this study from Italy, dogs were found to have a lot more receptors uh, of their endocannabinoid system, especially in the brain and spine. So we, you know, there's, these are photomicrographs of uh, in the cerebellum and you get the idea that you know, the, the G picture is a human, the H picture is a dog, and then uh, the I is monkey and then rat, but the darkness indicates the density of, of CBD receptors in, in the cerebellum, which is just astonishing. And this is also the reason why dogs are a lot more sensitive to it than we are. And cats are sort of lower down uh, in density, but and they have some different reactions as cats want to do. But this is part of why they're, you know, our pets are a lot more sensitive and can exhibit intoxication at a much lower dose than, than we would. Uh, the other thing is, is that as we age, the density of receptors increases. So it's like, you know, and these work for not only obviously the, the, you know, CBD and THC, but also are endogenous endocannabinoids. So um, it's like we need those things in there more uh, with more force to carry out the jobs. I don't know if it's because the, the uh, it's harder to get the signal across as we get older or what it is exactly. And that's, that's sort of up for discussion, but it does increase in density quite a bit. And so for this reason, especially with older pets, we have to be a little bit more cautious in increasing up to a higher dose. Uh, so the CB1 receptors, it said it's the one of the most abundant um, protein-based receptors found in the human brain and central nervous system. And it really helps to um, mediate both inhibition um, and modulation of these, all of these neurotransmitters from dopamine all the way over to acetylcholine. acetylcholine. And, uh, and that's important because if you're running around with way, way, way much serotonin floating around, that is, uh, I don't know if you've heard about a serotonin storm, but we certainly found out about that when we started using things like Prozac and um, all the serotonin reuptake inhibitor drugs, and that is an ugly thing. Um, I've had I've talked to people that have had serotonin storms, and they said it was one of the most miserable experiences of their lives because they couldn't control what was going on in their brains, and it just is not fun. But so you know, since the CB1 receptor is important in inhibiting action of some of these neurotransmitters, then it's also important in controlling mood, cognition, pain, reducing inflammation, reducing nausea, and then psychoactivity of, of THC. And then outside of the NS, the central nervous system, it's found in other, other tissues as well, in the fat, the liver, the musculoskeletal system you know, cardiovascular system, peripheral nerves and reproductive tract. So because this is found in the cardiovascular system with some um, density, this is where, again, it's important for pets that have existing heart disease to be very cautious with the dose because it can create some disturbances as far as um, the electrical conduction in the cardiovascular system as well as oxygenation changes for the better um, as far as improving it. But if that happens too fast in a patient that's compromised, then that's, that can be a really ugly situation too. So the CB2 receptors, again, they're primary, primarily in the cells of the immune system. So they're expressed on T cells, B cells, and macrophages, which are the sort of the general cleanup guys. But they're also found within the the other organs associated with the uh, immune system, the spleen, the liver, the kidney, and then the skin, uh, which we don't, we don't really think about that as having an immune system, but indeed there is a terrific amount going on there because uh, otherwise we'd have, come here, Ohio, we'd have all these invaders coming to get us um, you know, bacteria, 
mange mites, all of those really unattractive friends, able to penetrate the skin without a really active immune system on the skin level itself. So, you know, again, part of their functions are going to be immune modulation, reducing inflammation, and then strangely helping to maintain bone density, which is kind of a feedback. Um, you know, the more weight bearing exercise we do as we get older, the less likely we're, we are to have uh, reduced bone density as we get older. So one of the, you know, if we're, if we're talking about the endocannabinoid system, obviously it wasn't built in us, so to speak, to be responsive simply to plants, but to our endogenous um, endocannabinoids. So there are natural uh, neuromodulators and also neurotransmitters. And so these anandamide um, is one that pops up in situations where you really need help in a hurry. You need to, you know, if you're stressed out, it kind of helps ch chill you down. It helps to uh, inhibit further neurotransmitter release if you're already jacked up on um, uh, epinephrine, your endogenous epinephrine system. And then the 2AG seems to be more about sort of maintaining a basal tone so that you're not fluctuating too widely off of baseline. And other, other endogenous endocannabinoids are, uh, are the ones listed down there below. Um, but you can see they're related and structured to dopamine and to serine. So you can tell kind of what they, they will end up affecting. Uh, the other thing is that's interesting about these is that they go retrograde. So essentially, if we back up to this picture of the receptor, and I, I don't think... Yeah, my cursor doesn't show up there on the bottom. So the idea is at the top, neurotransmitters and other molecules will drop down into the space between the receptors. And the bottom is the receptor that ends up um, sort of receiving those transmitters. But what's interesting with these regulators is they go retrograde, meaning they go from the receptors back up across to the transmitter essentially and tell it to shut things off because we've got more than enough epinephrine or we've got more than enough of this. So that's how the central nervous system ends up and the immune system ends up um, modulating things a little bit. So we used to think of immune stimulators instead of immune modulators because we didn't understand that in many cases we actually need to calm the immune system down so that's one of the um, one of the really interesting things is that they can go backwards. Uh, so the and again the anandamide can be synthesized rapidly during a time of acute stress uh, to take care of any short term issues, and the two AG will go up or down based on what's needed in response to go to in the rest of the body. So. There are other receptors and targets of endocannabinoids. Um, these are some of, as you start to read more, you may run across all of these things. FA, F-A-A-H is one of the main ones that's discussed particularly in cancer. Um, and some of these are, are more familiar like GABA and dopamine, but all of these play roles and affect various receptors throughout the body but primarily in the, uh, in the central nervous system. Now, so phytocannabinoids, if we talked about endogenous endocannabinoids, um, as you can guess, endo means inside and phyto means plant. So uh, phytocannabinoids are the plant-based compounds that act on the cannabinoid receptors. And the two main ones that we think about, and there are over... I think something like 200 of them all together is delta, delta 9 uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, which is THC, and then uh, cannab cannabidol diol, which is CBD. And they have a myriad of effects, as you, you all are all familiar with, for THC, primarily pain relief, nausea relief, 
sleeping and then an appetite and mood stimulant. And then for CBD, um, it has more um, pain relief, anti-inflammatory, anti-anxiety and seizure reduction, as well as anti-nausea. So it's, it, it's, it's interesting that they're so different in effect, but there's none of the high effect with the CBD. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, there's over seven, you know, there's so many compounds within each plant. Um, there's over 114 phytocannabinoids so far. Terpenes are things that are found in essential oils and, and may you probably know a boatload about terpene, terpenes because you're, you're well versed in essential oils, but there are over 200 terpenes within the cannabis plant itself. Flavonoids, which are um, things like quercetin, uh, there's 29 of them. And then there's some vitamin B and essential fatty acids as well. So there's just a tremendous number of compounds with, within the plant itself. And this is something that um, you all may or may not be familiar with. So the cannabis plant itself is sort of um, the main focus right now has been on the flower or the bud. And that's where the majority of all these compounds are concentrated. And on these flowers, there are little trichomes, which are capsules of all of the, of many of the um, terpenes and all of the other, um, you know, good compounds that we associate with this plant. And so there are male flowers and female flowers and the female flowers are the ones that have the most, the highest concentration of all these compounds, although they are found in varying degrees throughout the plant. So what's important to know is that part of the varying effect we've seen with CBD across different products, I think has been due to the fact that many manufacturers will use things that are like the stem, the big leaves and the trim off of the, off of the flower or the bud. And these have much, much lower concentration. So I think that's why we were seeing such poor effect with some products and then really good effect with others. So CBD, Dog's Health uses only the, the flowers and essentially what they are doing is making an essential oil from the oils on the flower itself. So they're making an extraction that way. Uh, now cannabidiol um, doesn't, so when we think about something binding to a receptor, I always think of it in the past as just binding fully and nothing else can come onto the receptor or get off of it, but they have a, a really interesting effect. They bond moderately, which means they partially cover the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And what that ends up doing is that they stimulate the activity or increase the activity of our endocannabinoids, the things that are already in the body. So it helps to, um, it helps to prevent degradation of things, uh, compounds that we want to stay um, very active. Uh, it can reduce the effects of THC at binding sites as well. So, you know, in the good old days uh, when we were all younger, uh, marijuana that you bought might be four to eight uh, percent THC, but you know, it had a relatively high content of CBD in it. So for that reason, you might catch a, catch a buzz or get high, but not be stupid because so much of the medical marijuana now is something like, you know, 20, 30% THC and some of the distillate products are like 70% THC. So how these kids are walking and talking, I don't know, but they, they are. Um, and then we also do know too, that it helps to sort of dampen the psychoactive effects of THC uh, through the cytochrome P450 system. And that's one of the main um, waste clearing pathways in the liver. So we get all sorts of good effects that we're looking for as well, as far as analgesia, helping to reduce cancer, reduce inflammation, all the, all the stuff listed on the slide here. 
So that's how it works is, is to, it doesn't completely bind the receptor, but it ends up assisting the, the compounds that are native to the body in doing their work a little bit more effectively. Now you'll hear, we talk mostly about CBD, but in the hemp plant itself, the precursor CBDA is the most prevalent cannabinoid found. And it's got some different properties um, as far as uh, it's a little bit less effective than the CBD, but when it's converted in by either drying or heating it or and sometimes to the um, aging process, then it converts into the more active form in the body of CBD. But it's got some interesting properties in and of itself, which is why people were starting to look for CBDA type compounds. It, it is a great anti-inflammatory. It's been shown to be equal to um, carprofen in effect, as far as reducing pain and inflammation. And it has really good anti-cancer properties. Unfortunately, it is super unstable. And um, people that have produced a CBDA or a THCA product, unfortunately, that may start out as 100% CBDA, but over time, it degrades into CBD. And so you lose some of these properties. So they're the CBD dog folks are looking at adding in some CBDA to what they've got, but they haven't figured out a really good way to, to keep it stable so that the desired effect is maintained. And then same thing with THC, there's THCA, um, that is what's in the fresh plant. But again, as the plants are heated or dried or you know, basically messed with, it's converted over to the active, the psychoactive form of THC, the Delta-9 THC. Um, it does not bind to the CB1 receptors. And there are a lot of anti-cancer properties with this one as, as well as anti-inflammation, um, really good for things like fibromyalgia where you have a misperception of, of pain in your brain. Uh, and for chronic pain, because it sort of tones down that anxiety about pain level and things of that nature. So there's, there are people that are looking at like um, marijuana microgreens simply so that you can, you, can act, you can get THCA in a really stable form and you would actually you know, add it to a juice or eat it fresh. So that's, that's coming down the pike too. And then Delta 9 THC is the psychoactive form. And it is a partial agonist, so meaning it partially binds to CB1 and CB2. Um, and then its psychoactive effects are on the CB1 receptors. The interesting thing is that there is no LD50, which is, so LD50 is how big of a dose does it take to literally kill the lethal dose for half of the dogs in a study? there is no LD50 and they've given more than 3000 milligrams per kilograms of body weight of THC. Now they will be knocked out <laughs> and sort of stuporous for, for you know, several days or perhaps a week on end, but, but it is not actually lethal uh, with, it, with the exception of elderly dogs that may have some um, heart disease going on already. So but you know, for healthy pets, they really cannot, uh, cannot get them, they could not find an LD50 dose in dogs. So the, the upside of THC is the analgesia, the reduced reduction of nausea, redu reduction in cancer, um, reducing anxiety, sedation. And then where it first kind of came out in the 70s back as a medicinal product was reduction of intraocular pressure for glaucoma. Um, it seems to protect the brain uh, in too high a dose. It also seems to, to mess up the brain a bit. And then it's a bronchodilator, helps with sleep and, and GI support. So there's a lot of beneficial effects with this, but most of America has been focused on the, the anxiety part, uh, reduction of anxiety, and you know, and frankly, just getting high. And so that's why we've had all these products developed and these strains of marijuana that are so high in THC and um, 
you know, it sort of blows past any potential medicinal benefit for them. Um, and then one of the other compounds that are in high quantities in, in the, CB, in the uh, marijuana plant or the can, cannabis plant is uh, terpenes. And these are the ones that give smell and taste to these products. And, you know, as I said, they're in tons of different other, um, other plants as well. So things like limonene, squalene, vitamin A, and actually natural rubber um, are, are all considered to be terpenes, which is kind of weird. I hadn't realized vitamin A was. So they're, they're all over the place, but they're used by plants to protect themselves from bugs, um, for, to, for chemical signaling, so, you know, to tell male plants to kind of turn this way to send off their pollen and fertilize the, the female flower. Uh, so these are also in the trichomes in the plant. So again, if you're extracting that, the, your CBD product from that bud, you're gonna incorporate a ton of terpenes. Um, and again, you know, some of the ones that, that you may be familiar with are limonene is that's super common and then pinene. Um, so in pine needles and rosemary, and then my myrcene, which is um, got a also found in mango and lemongrass, and evidently this is the one that uh, that knocks you out uh, or makes you sleepy. But you can see the different terpenes have different effects within the body. So that's where um, like an essential oil of lemon is refreshing and sort of opens your mind back up and uh, rosemary and pine can be very calming as well. Um, and so again, they have their own physio physiological effects within the body um, and they affect, they alter how cannabis will affect the body when used in combination with the cannabinoids. So myrcene again is found in higher concentrations in an indica type strain. And this is the one that tends to be used to, to really create sedation. Um, and they have various effects, which are, are pretty cool. Uh, and then the flavonoids is the, one of the other major compounds in there. And they also are responsible for antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and immune support. So there's quite a bit of quercetin, interestingly enough, in, uh, in cannabis plants. And so we, we get all of those anti-inflammatory properties. And quercetin is involved in... Um, reducing pro proliferation of cancer cells, um, in increasing apoptosis or normal cell death, and then reducing inflammation and a histamine, all those good things. But there's just a boatload of different compounds throughout the, that plant. So all of these together work to create something called the entourage effect. And it's the proposed mechanism of action of why the plant itself, the whole uh, plant works better than an isolated compound. Um, so you'll hear this talked about quite a bit as well. And for that reason, we know that specific molecules might exert a specific effect, but when you try to isolate them and get them to, to do that specific thing, they just don't seem to work as well as they did in a full spectrum extract. So current research, you know, for medical uses, since we don't know how to manipulate the effect of these individual compounds, the current research says to use a full spectrum extract. So having, you know, so that's the, that's what that means is that it's, you take the, all of these active compounds out of the plant and put them into something that the pet or the person can use to help combat whatever, whatever health issue they're struggling with. So to be called um, a, a CBD product, that means that it's come from a hemp plant and that means that there is less equal to or less than 0.3% THC. So we still have a small amount of THC present as well as the CBD and the terpenes and flavonoids and all the, all the compounds out there. The other thing you may see out there are broad spectrum. Um, and what has happened is they have removed all of the THC and, um, and some of the other 
uh, cannabinoids. So the THC, the THCA, and a couple of other of the flavonoids have come out. And then there are isolate products, which are only CBD. And these are going to, this is what that um, Epidiolex, which is the um, patented version of CBD for seizure treatment is composed of. And there's a problem with that. And I'm gonna pass this video up um, and kind of jump into the research. Uh, and I'll, I'll circle back to the Epidiolex issue in a second. So we're starting to get some really great studies out there. Um, this is one of the ones that makes veterinarians afraid of CBD. The study was done at CSU and they gave 10 milligrams of CBD per kilogram per day. So in a 10 pound dog, that's gonna be 50 milligrams um, per day or up to 100 milligrams per day for six days. And they saw that it was really well tolerated, but they did see an elevation in alkaline phosphatase in 36% of the patients. And so if you'll remember, I said that cytochrome P450 is one of the main pathways of the liver clearing things out. And we know that there is an effect in that cytochrome P450 um, field. And it, so the question is, is that, is there truly um, liver, uh, you know, the liver is having some difficulty clearing all of this, or does it mean that like prednisone, there's a specific isoenzyme of alkaline phosphatase that gets elevated in response to a relatively higher dose. Everything else stayed normal. Um, there was some mild diarrhea in all dogs and then uh, some of the dogs also had nausea. And then there was also some redness in the ear pinna in about uh, a little less than half of the dogs. So the, you know, there, was, there have not been follow-up studies to see, does this mean that uh, this gets better with time or does it get worse or what happens exactly? You know, the, the CBD dog health folks, again, recommend a relatively high dose of their heel product. So we're in the 35 to 55 milligram range of the dose. And because they suggest that for all patients, um, we're in that bottom end of the dose range, potentially, if you're using the super high end of the dose. So that is something that if, you know, Jamie had a, you know, Willie's got other, other things to worry about, but if you see an elevation in serum alkaline phosphatase after relatively high doses of CBD, that, that could be part of what's going on. I think that's why his vet too was a little leery when, we, when I kind of mentioned it a little bit about yeah. using it with the CCNU. Because yeah. that can affect the liver. Yeah, and that's the thing. And I, you know, at, at the time, I didn't have enough information. So the, again, we're not really sure. Does this mean it really is affecting the liver, or or that we've induced an isoenzyme of ALP? And I think the jury is still out on that. But this is the study that generally freaks out most conventional veterinarians. Um, and so we also don't know. You know, I think the effect goes away once you discontinue, but does that mean you can come back at a lower dose? And that's, that's a big question mark too. So there's been several other studies out there um, as far as arthritis goes, and I'm gonna kind of blow through these fairly quickly, but um, we'll put a PDF of the slides up there so you can go back and reference the, um, all of these studies. And then actually there's a link on the CBD dog health site that shows, that has all of the studies uh, set up there for you. So there's another one at looking at osteoarthritis pain. And again, um, you know, really good, good effect uh, as far as reducing pain. And in some cases equal to Rimadyl and all of the other uh, prescription drugs. Um, and then, you know, the big study on epilepsy, which came out not too long ago. And, um, this is one of the first studies looking specifically at using CBD for cancer treatment. And this one it was in combination with fincristine, 
um, so a first generation uh, of, of the drug that Willie was using. And uh, it, ultimately it was found to increase apoptosis, which is, to, which is normal cell death. So that was, that was pretty cool. And then this one is really interesting as well. So in this cross section of skin, so there's a ton of CB1 and two receptors and they are kind of all over the place in the skin, uh, but there are receptors in the nerve endings and then in the immune cells. So again, it can help upregulate, downregulate the immune system as is needed to keep things kind of in homeostasis again. Um, but it's, it's amazing. And evidently, uh, this is, <laughs> so they're looking at a combination of CBD and caffeine, strangely enough, to restart hair growth in people, especially. Um, so for dogs that have alopecia X and um, that are sort of frozen in telomere, I don't have you, have you ever seen that in older dogs where, or dogs that have been super stressed or sick, they'll just stop making hair in a couple of locations and then six months or a year later, they may restart making it for, for no clear rhyme or reason. But I thought that was interesting. They're combining it with caffeine topically to get hair to start regrowing. And then, uh, you know, more, more effects as far as neuroendocrine regula regulation and hormone secretion, because that's part of what um, they think helps. Again, we're, we're looking at homeostasis. So CBD dog health folks have had a terrific amount of success for dogs with Cushing's. And where, the, where they think that's helping is to help regulate the endocrine system so that it begins to function more normally. And, and then lastly, in horses, they found that um, they could consume uh, CBD products without a problem. And they are excited to see if that will help again with many of the hormonal problems these guys end up having as far as Cushing's disease again in horses and um, so that's kind of a new, a new uh, field coming out. The main, the biggest concern was to, if you have an intoxicated horse, that's pretty scary to have a, you know, 1200 pound animal kind of staggering around the barn. So this kind of cleared the way for, for future resources and uh, research in horses. Um, you know, what's clear in the humans is that an unhealthy endocannabinoid system can lead to excessive inflammation. And, and immune dysfunction. And so this is one of the ways that uh, CBD products and cannabinoids can help combat inflammation is to help the immune system learn to regulate itself a little bit better. And um, it also appears to decrease the uh, release of messengers that would tell the immune system to crank up the inflammation. So reducing production of reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species, which are the guys that get in there and, and start killing stuff, uh, killing cells inappropriately. And this is kind of what I alluded to earlier. For some strange reason, the United States government actually has the patent on cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. And, uh, this is a little frightening because um, with things like Epidiolex uh, now being a, a, a drug, an FDA product, CBD manufacturers are getting calls from, the, from their lawyers trying to shut them down because they have a CBD product. And because they are full spectrum products or broad spectrum products and not isolates. So far they've been able to, to stop sort of the onslaught, but the legal, um, the legal atmosphere is getting really nasty about this. So it's, it's kind of concerning that, you know, big pharma is going to step in and try to uh, prevent access to, to CBD products across the board. Um, and whether they'll be successful or not is another question, but this is 
this is something that's on the horizon. And if that starts to be more of a problem, this is where we're going to have to get really active and write congressmen, senators, and, and all of the legislators we can to prevent this from happening because um, they're already out there trying to ha hammering on the doors. Um, the other part, you know, and as I said, there's a lot of expression of these uh, receptors within the GI tract. And so again, this can help with increase with decreasing intestinal motility for um, patients with IBS, um, decreasing gastric acid secretion, which can be a plus or a minus, but really helping to um, improve alterations in the epithelial bar barrier, um, improving immune function in the gut, and then either being an appetite stimulant or, you know, using a, uh, a suppressive effect too. And, I'm, and again, that's part of that modulatory thing. If you need to eat more, it helps you want to eat more. And then if you need to eat less, it helps to kind of help your brain uh, stop thinking, stop making you think you need to eat more. Um, and then there's on the human side there, again, there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies um, there. And again, I'll get this link out there for you to, to their page with links to all of these studies on there if you're interested in doing a deeper dive on the research. Um, and then one other, the other distinction that's important, um, especially if you're looking at, you know, using products in higher doses, again, you know, the general rule of thumb is to go slow and low and build your way up. But there is a difference between toxicity and intoxication. And as I said earlier, nobody has found an LD50 or a lethal dose 50 for THC. So mostly what we see is intoxication or overload of the receptors. Um, let's see if I can get these to, nope, to play. But essentially this is, a, and I wish uh, I was smarter to, uh, smart enough to get the video to play, but um, looking at this pug, you can see he's got this kind of look and in the video he's sort of doing this number. So he is at a high dose because he has some pretty significant health problems. And for about three to four days, um, he, he had this static ataxia and the video of him walking down the hall, he's sort of staggering. And then three or four days later, this last video shows him walking around normally. And that's what happens. You have to kind of, we used to call it acclimate or accommodate to to the drugs. And so, for instance, with phenobarbital or uh, potassium bromide, when we're starting to treat dogs with seizures, you can see these same effects. They're just, they're staggering down the hall because their brains are just full up to here of these drugs and they have to figure out how to deal with them. And again, you know, dogs have the highest concentration of these receptors, especially for THC in the cerebellum. Uh, with THC, again, some side effects can, can be pretty pronounced, but mostly they will clear up with time. The, the main one, though, to be concerned about is with the cardiovascular system. It can cause increased heart rate and low blood pressure. And if you have a pet that has really profound uh, heart disease, you want to go very, very carefully with introducing both THC and CBD. Um, there can be some urinary incontinence, uh, which again will resolve. And uh, again, the concern about elevated alkaline phosphatase levels. On the human side, there are some concerns about needing to change doses of anesthetic drugs for people that are on medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. So, you know, with fentanyl and midazolam is the one that's uh, twilight anesthesia, and then propofol is the um, the milk of amnesia, as they as they like to say in anesthesia land. Um, you can actually have to use quite a bit higher dose to get get the same effect to get the patient anesthetized. So definitely things to to bear in mind. Um, administration and dosage. Um, many of these, you know. The, much of this is you're, you're already familiar with. So sublingual, 
seems and oral administration seem to be the best way. Oral takes longer. Um, transdermal works reasonably well, though that takes longer as well. And then like uh, Valium for patients that are having seizures, it can be administered rectally as well to get quick absorption. So again, this chart just sort of goes uh, through how, how the route. Um, so the bottom line is dermal, uh, transdermal. So it eventually gets some absorption, but it is not near as good as oral or um, mucosal absorption. Um, so you know, the idea that Angela is, likes to say is to just sort of put it in that gum pocket and then give them a treat afterwards. And I think that works reasonably well. I had some problems with Hyo with the Calm product. Um, she didn't like the, the lavender, I think. But if you, she seemed to get over it pretty quickly because breakfast was coming immediately afterwards. So, you know, for all of our pets, we have to, we have to, you know, we have guidelines to go with, but we have to think about how old they are, how they might respond, what other medications they might be on. Uh, and again, just sort of go low and slow until you work up to um, what's appropriate for them. And so this kind of goes into um, the product line that CBD Dog Health has, but, and the most, most of the rest of this, I think you guys are familiar with. So uh, that's what I have for you so far. And I'm, is, is that something that's been helpful for you? Is this been helpful for information or? Yeah, I, for me, I'm, well, I'm kind of in the thick of trying to figure out CBD and THC, so <laughs> yeah. that's good information. Yeah. So, and, and for where you are, Jamie, I think that, you know, that, or for where Willie is, um, that half a milligram dose from, from talking a little bit with, with Dr. Zach, um, that's a good starting point. And you can increase that um, over time. So Dr. Haza mentioned that f even for cats, she may end up having a cat on two milligrams of THC and then 35 to 40 to 50 milligrams of a, of a full spectrum CBD product. And for cats with cancer, she said that was one of the, you know, the few things that actually gave them a feeling of release from that malaise that they were experiencing every day. And sometimes they would combine that with chemotherapy and sometimes not, but that was one of the the few ways she could get cats with advanced cancer really comfortable. Um, so, it, you know, everything is a starting dose. The things you would sort of look for are the intoxication side effects. But again, you know, you're really, it is, it's, it's almost impossible to make a dog, um, to kill a dog with THC. It's, as long as, you know, if you find a, uh, a point where there's severe intoxication, like staggering and things of that nature, obviously you want to protect them and make sure that they're not banging their heads into the wall and things of that nature. But that effect generally goes away within, you know, eight to 12 hours. And how about you, May? Can, has this been helpful or not? Um, one, the products that we're currently getting from CBD dog do not have the THC in them. It's the really, really low dose. That's right. So any product that you can sell as a CBD product has 0.3% of THC or less. As so. long as that seems to be doing the job, there's no reason to look at adding THC. THC. That's right. And, and primarily where THC is getting used now in veterinary medicine is, is in cancer. Um, Second question, um, because I don't want him to consistently have the essential oil in ease, mm -hmm. um, we're going back and forth between ease and heal. And you, you touched upon it at, at the last video, I think, or two ago. Um, I'm so confused because heal has is so much more powerful 
yet they still want you to give them so much more of it. Well, let me pop this back up so this make a little bit more sense. So again, Heal is designed for um, pets that are really sick. And the gold dose again is 35 to 50 milligrams per day. And so it will say on the label to give roughly the same volume as the Ease product. But again, right. we've got, you know, 550 milligrams versus um, 1100 milligrams. So it's literally double strength. So what you would do is whatever volume of ease, or actually, I guess you're using, yeah, you're using ease yeah, for the frankincense. He's getting a full dropper of ease. Okay. So whatever volume that is, uh, which is probably an ML, you would literally cut that in half with heel. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's, that's kind of- That's not what they told me. Yeah, it, but I mean, comparing apples to apples, that's going to take you with the same dose. So again, the calm's at that same 550 milligrams per dropper, but essentially the heel is double strength for both of those products. Does that make, so yeah. that. Okay, that, way, that, that I mean, what you're saying makes a lot more sense to me than what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah, because you, I mean, that's what's working for him is that, is that 550 milligrams of CBD plus the frankincense and myrrh in there and ter, I guess turmeric and frankincense. Um, yeah, so if your, your goal is to cycle off of the essential oils, which makes sense, yeah, then you would just use a half dose of heal. And one week each is good or should I go longer? Do you notice a, a return of uh, problems if you go for the longer only, than a week off? I can't tell a difference at this point. I've only cycled once. So, <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's still pretty new. Um, yeah. And the reason he was on this is for both the fibroid, which I won't know till he's tested in months, um, and um, seizure. And he hasn't had any seizures since he went up on ease. So I, I don't want to rock the boat, you know? Right. I hear you. And so, you know, there's, and this is, we're back to that whole concept of there's the recommended dose. And then there's the dose that works for, for spirit. And while they may recommend 1100 milligrams for seizures and maybe thyroid dysfunction, certainly for the seizures, I mean, that's the thing that's crystal clear, 550 milligrams is doing the job. Right. And, and I think that's reasonable. And I think the other thing is, is that there is time to effect. So, with thyroid, because that can take, I mean, even on the human side, they're saying, you know, wait, wait six weeks before you retest something. Um, it may take six weeks or it may take three months before you will see an effect on the thyroid function. So if you don't get the numbers back that you're looking for the first time, and, you know, maybe wait three months and see if everything else looks good. And, uh, you know, skin looks good. He's feeling well. The seizures are well controlled. Then I think you could wait up to three months to recheck. All right. Great. Thank you. You bet. I'm really curious. I haven't, I stopped the THC with Willie with this nerve paralysis issue because I don't know what test the neurologist is going to want to run. Sure. And I'm in Wisconsin and technically. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hear you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of curious. He, he goes in Thursday morning. I'm kind of curious. I want to start it up after that. So I'm kind of curious to see if it makes a difference. Yeah, I, I would. I wanted blood work to come back good if, it, if they ran any kind of toxicity. 
<laughs> yeah, and generally, generally they don't because they gotta, you know, they gotta get you to pay for it essentially. But but I believe me, I understand what you're saying. So I mean, there's a there's an interesting thing. I mean, I think you said you saw some eyebrow movement, um, which is really encouraging. Yep. And so hopefully, what you're going to see is more and more of that come comes back. Um, yeah, I rubbed one of the areas on his face too that was like a little bit of a scab, and kind of when I rubbed it, he flinched away from me. So I'm oh good I'm hopeful of that too. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry it hurt, but I'm glad it did. Yeah. So, God, poor buddy. Uh, you really have had a hell of a time with this. So yeah, I'll be you know keep us posted, uh, and hopefully what you'll see is that I'm not sure how much the THC will add as far as um, bringing back the Bell's policy. But or the neuro, you know, trigeminal nerve, whatever it is, neuropathy. Yeah, I think it, is. yeah neuropathy is as fair enough a description as anything else. But um, but I think it will improve how he feels on a daily basis, and that may be one of the few tools left you have to directly impact the cancer. Yeah. So. Yeah, and you see. I mean, he just, he's lost so much muscle, the temporalis muscle too. So there, I and mean, it's hard to know where that came from, but the venerella bean, I think is the, probably the culprit. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I really, he would, I don't know. I'm, I think that too. But you know, husband thinks it, it spread, but I think it was the chemo. Yeah. And, 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 you know, either theory is as likely to be right as, as the other there's the body. <laughs> All right, ladies. Um, anything else I can help you with today? I don't think so. I'm going to go ahead and, and get out of here. All right. Me too. Uh, and take, take good care. We'll get this posted up um, within the next week and we'll go from there. Great to talk with you both. Thank you very much. With pleasure. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.